Salvation is not for the Jewish nation only. You know, a long time ago, the people of Egypt, they made the people of Israel their slaves for more than 400 years. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of those years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. After Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, God destroyed the Egyptian army. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. The Israelites' relationship with the people of Egypt, it did not end there. No. Many years later, King Solomon, he married the daughter of a Pharaoh of Egypt. It's common for a king to marry the daughter of another king, of, an, of another nation. And the reason is to keep peace between the two kingdoms. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. For many years, the Egyptians and the children of Jacob, Israel, they opposed each other. Many years after Isaiah had died, another Egyptian pharaoh, he killed King Hosea. He was the king of Judah. In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. King Hosea went to meet him, and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo as soon as he saw him. When the people of Judah when they first heard Isaiah's prophecy about the people of Egypt being reconciled to God and that they would join them to worship God. Wow, can you imagine the people of Judah, their astonishment? What? Let's look at the verse. In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. When they cry to the Lord because of oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender and deliver them. And the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day and worship with sacrifice and offering and they will make vows to the Lord and perform them. When Isaiah prophesied that God would reveal himself to the people of Egypt, boy, they would be convicted and trembling and emotional like a woman would be. And they would fear God, and that would achieve their salvation. In that day, the Egyptians will be like women and tremble with fear before the hand that the Lord of hosts shakes over them, and the land of Judah will become a terror to the Egyptians. Isaiah said there would be five cities in Egypt that would speak the language of Canaan. That's the Hebrew language. Also, that they would worship the Lord God. In that day, there will be five cities in the land of Egypt that speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord of hosts. Wow. The people of Egypt, they were converted. That's amazing. And they would speak the Hebrew language. That's the language of Holy Scripture. Question, did Isaiah prophesy about five real cities in Egypt? Or did he mean most of the area in Egypt would be converted? Like a miracle, which? Well, we don't really know for sure. We don't know. But we do know that God accepted Egypt and Assyria, who previously went against Israel, that he accepted them to join them as his people. That's amazing. Understand that scripture says, it says that Egypt and Assyria and Israel, they would all worship God as equals. Whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people. And Assyria, the work of my hands. And Israel, my inheritance. Okay, now let's apply this to our Christian life. You know, in Isaiah 19, 19, Isaiah says that there will be an altar, that the altar to the Lord set up in the midst of Egypt. 
In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar to the Lord at its border. Wow. Well, you know, Matthew Henry, a pastor from a long time ago, he said about Isaiah 19:19, 19, 19, he said it pointed to that worshiping God in spirit and truth. Where? Well, any place. And Jesus explains about this in John 4, verses 21 through 24. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. When God's enemies become his followers they can worship god anywhere it does not have to be a specific place on the mountain over here over there no anywhere you can worship god any place the people of judah well wow, they were astonished they were just astonished that the people of G egypt had changed so much and were worshiping with them it's the same as today. There's people out there that we think they'll never become a Christian. Never. And then we're astonished when we see that they are converted. Apostle Paul, a long time ago at the time when he was preaching, he knew that there were people in other countries that would be converted. How do you know? Well, he knew because he was taught it, the doctrine of election from the scripture. And that helped him to go on preaching without any fear. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. If you and I have the right understanding of the doctrine of election, that will encourage evangelism. And secondly, it will it let us know that evangelism will be successful. And how we know this? Well, we will know this because we have the right doctrine. And that will conquer our fear of failure. We'll conquer that fear. And we'll keep on faithfully preaching the gospel, whatever we go through, if people persecute us or not. If we understand two things. First is that we need to understand that the gospel itself has power. Do we have power in ourselves? No, we don't. The gospel has power. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And secondly, God himself is sovereign. He could change anyone whom he chooses, anyone whom he has mercy on. Here's the verse that explains this clearly, that God himself chooses the person that he will work in their heart and change them. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Behold, I will gather from them all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place and I will make them dwell in safety and they shall be my people and I will be their God and I will give them one heart and one way and they may fear me forever for their own good and for the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. You notice in those verses? That's exactly what would happen to the people in Egypt, the same thing with the people in Assyria, and exactly what would happen to people in every nation around the world. People will turn to Christ every nation around the world. Let's look at this verse. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Wow. You know, people from every nation, from every group, from every language will be saved. They will. That's a promise. But how is that possible? How? Well, it's possible because God is sovereign. God can change anyone. Coram Dio.